hablo despacio, pero en inglés. <laughs> right, the left, left-wing philosophy and politics has been with us for a long time, but I want to say the left that we face today, this generation, is not the same as the left from 50 years ago or from 100 years ago. There has been a major shift in the philosophy, a major shift in the strategy. So now we talk about the postmodern left as opposed to the modern left. Now the whole story is not politics, but politics is important. There's been an intellectual revolution in some parts of the humanities, spreading over into the social sciences, and this shift has been of a significant enough nature that we say we've broken in those segments from modernism to postmodernism. I want to say initially then, what do we mean by postmodernism? So here is Michel Foucault, perhaps the most famous of all of the postmodern thinkers, and he is using a metaphor here, a geology metaphor, right, arguing that we have undergone an earthquake intellectually, culturally, uh, and as with an earthquake, huge destruction, huge devastation has occurred. But as a result of that earthquake, we can now see deep into the earth, to the foundations, the different strata have been revealed. And that is what has occurred in particularly Western civilization. Richard Rorty, American postmodernist, also talking about the world historical significance of this revolution. And notice the time span he talks about. We, postmoderns now, what we are trying to figure out in our generation is, what are we supposed to do now that the age of faith, age of faith, 1,000 years of Western history from fall of the Roman Empire to early modernity, Protestant Reformation, Renaissance. That was a failure. Then, the four or 500 years since then, the entire modern world, which was capstone with the Enlightenment, we became enlightened, that also, according to Rorty, has been a failure. And the point the postmoderns are making is that 1,500 years of civilization is wrong. We have been on the wrong track. And the postmoderns are identifying that as a fundamentally flawed way of thinking about the world, a fundamentally flawed set of institutions, and they are reacting against that and wanting to replace it with something else. Now, what is this Enlightenment project? This is essentially the modern world. I've got some timeline here. We go back to the 1600s. Major thinkers, Francis Bacon, John Locke, Rene Descartes, figures we recognize from our philosophy courses and intellectual history. And they are revolutionary in the 1600s, arguing for the importance of reason, empirical methods, developing data, becoming better at mathematics, not relying on faith, mystical revelation, and the mere fact that there are traditions for, that are in place. We will think and think for ourselves and get the data and do the arguments. That's an intellectual revolution. It's not an accident that in the next generations we can see modern science starting to develop in physics, in chemistry, mathematics becoming more sophisticated, biology becoming more sophisticated, and the important names Isaac Newton, Gottfried Leibniz, and dozens of others. As the scientific revolution takes place in the late 1600s into the 1700s, we see an engineering revolution and the industrial revolution in the middle part of the 1700s starts to transform how we think about engineering and the production of material goods. When we start thinking about human beings more scientifically and getting away from magical and supernatural understandings of what makes us sick, medicine is transformed Edward Jenner with vaccination, uh, medical chemistry, the empirical approaches to figuring out what actually makes people sick. 
Now, this story we know as a result, the engineering, a huge explosion in the amount of material goods that are available to people. More things, better quality, better prices. Everybody can afford to get most things. Health starts to go up. Life expectancy increases dramatically starting in the 1700s on into the 1800s. And so people are living better. But equally important was a revolution as a result of modern philosophy in the value branches, in ethics. Because everybody, the early moderns argued, had the capacity for reason to think, to look at the world, to make their own judgments, to govern their own lives. As a result of that, we see a rise of individualism. We have to respect each individual's own judgment, their own pursuits, their own values. And then as a result of that, liberalism starts to come into place and we see revolutions all over places where this Enlightenment revolution is occurring. The glorious revolution in England, the American revolution, the French revolution. It's not an accident that they are all happening going in the direction of political liberalism in the same century. That we're going to leave individuals free in their own lives, uh, to let them participate in the political process. We are not going to have kings and queens and authorities who have power over us. And the same thing happens in the economic realm. A revolution, Adam Smith published in 1776 on the wealth of nations, the same year Thomas Jefferson is writing the Declaration of Independence. That is not a coincidence. In the economic sphere, we can leave individuals free to decide their own productive measures, to be consumers, to trade with whomever they want, uh, to have individual property rights and so forth. So we have revolutions politically, people become more free. Revolutions economically, people become more wealthy. We add that there's more things available and people are living longer. For the first time in human history, around the late 1700s, early 1800s, the idea that people should be happy, that they should be able to make progress in their lives, that when I start as a young person, by the time I am older, I should be able to improve my condition. And that should be normal, not an accident, that I can make the world better for my children and that they will make the world better for their children and we will be able, with this Enlightenment philosophy, solve all problems. Very optimistic view. Now this is what the postmoderns are saying has been a fraud, has been a failure. This is the modern intellectual product project put into practice. They believe now, two centuries later, it has been a fraud. So Foucault, for example, attacking right here about reason. Well, the moderns think right, that they have reason on their side, that we have figured out certain very important truths. We hold these truths to be self-evident and that we, as a result of science and engineering and knowledge, we now know certain things that are very important. One part of postmodernism is a strong skepticism that came out of philosophy, and all of the postmoderns believe that the claims of reason, the claims of logic, the claims that we can somehow know the truth have been revealed to be a fraud. There is no such thing. This is a very strong claim. And one of the things we know that is characteristic of postmodernism, particularly on the left, is its critical skepticism of any claim that is put forth. If we don't think that there is reason, if we don't think it's about truth and knowledge, well then what are we doing? Really, all that's left with is if there is no reason and truth governing the world, is power. And here's Franklin Trickia as a professor saying explicitly, postmodernism right, seeks not to find the foundation and the conditions of truth. We are no longer interested in truth. We don't think that is possible. What we are interested in then is power. Power for the purpose of social change. Now the modernists are interested in power, power for the purpose of social change, but in the interest of truth and justice and the pursuit of knowledge. But we are not doing that anymore. 
So what you do then as a professor is you don't train individuals to think for themselves, to be aware that the world is complicated and that they need to look at arguments on both or all sides of the debate and trust their individual judgment. Instead, you believe, you have your beliefs, your agenda, your job as a professor when you have power is to basically indoctrinate your students to believe what you believe and to get them to become social activists. One's task as a professor is to help students spot, confront, and work against the political horrors of one's time. The Enlightenment said we are making the world a better place. The postmoderns reject all of that. The world is horrible, and the job of the professor is to teach the horribleness of the world and turn students into activists who will be against the current system. Men and women, the Enlightenment had said they should have equal rights, equal liberties, and the part of the modern project has been to extend the franchise, extend education. Men and women, of course, have some differences, even a difference, but basically their relationship is a win-win, mutually beneficial, uh, mutual care, and so forth. The postmoderns are arguing there is no such thing. That also, that optimistic view of human relations is a fraud. It is about power. Males have more power. They use it to advance their own interests against women. So in her postmodern phase, here's Amor. I suppose you know this word, right? The normal fuck, right? By a normal man, right? Is predation, right? So there's no happy, there's no romance. This is not win-win. This is not progress. This is caveman, but we're being brutally honest about that fact. So hence the adversarialism, men versus women, that some forms of postmodern feminism take. So it's not that we're interested in working with men for mutual interests and mutual respect. We believe it is a battle and we are just taking up the battle on the other side of the equation. Same thing applies then in foreign policy. Jean-Francois Lyotard, one of the major postmodern thinkers, arguing in the international scene, we Western liberals, we moderns, we believe in truth, justice, liberty for the whole world. We're interested in exporting liberalism and tolerance and human rights everywhere. The argument is that is a fraud, a cover. That's a cover story. Really what's going on is the rich countries, the powerful countries are just interested in advancing their interests and the weaker countries in the world have all kinds of problems. In this case, he's talking about Saddam Hussein, the brutal dictator in uh, Iraq before he was deposed. And the argument is he was not a bad guy in the sense of being a homegrown bad dictator. Instead, the fault uh, belongs to the rich countries, the United States and the others, for creating the conditions in which a dictator like uh, Hussein would arise. And we see the other names up there, it's the same thing. Hitler was not a homegrown problem for the Germans. The problem was what the rich Western nations did to Germany. Franco, what the Western nations did to Spain and so forth. And Jacques Derrida, a quotation here, <clears throat> significant just the number of times Marxism recognized here while much of postmodernism is sometimes pitched as being not political. Right? Uh, Derrida and the others pay explicit acknowledgement to their roots in Marxism, and that's going to be the main focus for the rest of my remarks here today. Deconstruction, that's a literary method that the postmoderns use, but notice what he's saying is basically applied Marxism. Now what that means, hard story. But the idea is we're against reason, we know postmoderns divide people into groups that are in conflict with each other, so it's not this mutually beneficial trade that capitalism promises. It's not this optimistic liberalism that we think politically is going to come about. We know that they are suspicious of science, uh, suspicious of the Industrial Revolution, and uh, this is a harder sell here, but there's postmodern applications to medicine that are rather dark, but we will set those aside. The idea that we are making progress, the postmoderns reject that in their entirety. The whole project is a fraud from their perspective. Now this is a philosophical battle, and I want to point out these are the most influential four postmodern thinkers. Jean-Francois Lyotard, Michel Foucault, uh, Richard Rorty, 
Jacques Derrida, three Frenchmen and one American. All of them are PhDs. And the important thing is that all of them are PhDs in philosophy specifically, all of them writing their PhD dissertations in theories of knowledge, theories of epistemology. Philosophy was at a very skeptical, relativistic, subjectivistic place in the middle part of the 20th century. And an important part of postmodernism is that epistemological knowledge-based skepticism and a rejection of the claims of reason, truth, scientific method, and so forth. That is important. But I want to say the politics is equally important. And here, if you look at the political views of all four of them, it's not a coincidence that all four of them are from the very far left politically. Editors of neo-Marxist journals, far left socialist journals of various sorts, actually joining the French Communist Party as Foucault did for a while, being widely admiring of uh, Mao's communist experiment in China and so forth. And you can do this claim yourself, but if you look at all of the major postmodernists of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, identify the top 100 of them, they are all of the far left politically. There's a new strategy at work here. Now, why a new strategy and why then? I think we have to say something about the history of Marxism. So we all recognize Uncle Karl. <laughs> My introductory microeconomics professor in university, even though he was kind of a conservative free market guy, looked exactly like Karl Marx. I think he cultivated it. It was very disconcerting. <laughs> Markets are not bad, <laughs> says Uncle Carl. But 1950s, when the leading postmodern thinkers are emerging as young men with their PhDs and some young women among them, what's going on in the far left? And the point is going to be that the far left really is in a crisis. Right? It's a terrible 20 years for the far left. Now, partly it's a matter of a realization that the Communist Manifesto was published in 1848, and in it, it made very specific predictions about what was going to happen in the capitalist nations. The rich would get richer, the poor would get poorer, the poor would get their class consciousness, they would become organized, there would be a violent revolution, we would kill off all of the rich people, and we would be able to re-educate people to become the new communist ideal human beings and that this was happening very fast. 100 years later, though, there is no sign whatsoever that the communist revolution is going to happen. And that is very dispiriting. And you read the far leftists of the 1950s and the 1960s, you can see them saying, I'm really getting tired of making predictions that the revolution is coming soon, right? Because we've been doing it for 100 years and it hasn't happened. So there's something wrong with a theory, right? And if you're a smart person and your theory has made predictions and those theories, predictions fail, 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 you're still going to think. And there was a lot of thinking going on in the 1950s among the far left. The liberal capitalist West was supposed to be finished. World War I, according to the left, was the final stages of capitalism. The Depression was the final stages of capitalism. World War II was the final stages of capitalism. What happens after World War II? Well, everybody's buying televisions and new cars and bigger houses and going on vacations and having lots of clothes and having lots of extra food that they throw away at the end of the meal. Even poor people are buying air conditioners for their homes. The liberal capitalist West is not filled with exploited workers and proletariat who are going to become revolutionary. The exact opposite seems to be happening. Also in the 1950s, it's important to remember how admiring, adulation, wonderful the Soviet Union was thought to be. Lenin, Trotsky, I think we're going to hear from some Trotskyites tonight, that's my understanding. Stalin, wonderful, showing the world the great new moral vision and what socialism can bring forth for the world. And then in the 1950s, two disasters. Stalin dies, and there, of course, had been all of those discussions and rumors about the gulag and the secret trials and the tortures and the ex 
executions, but that could be dismissed as just you know, CIA propaganda. But what happened in 1956, the new premier, Nikita Khrushchev, admitted publicly that all of that was true. That under the Soviet Union, which was supposed to be this beacon of moral idealism, millions of people had been deliberately starved, tortured, executed. Their own people. And that's brutal. If you believe that socialism is a moral ideal, and you've admired someone like Joseph Stalin and the country, how do you handle that? That's a problem. And then 1956 in Hungary, one of the satellite states controlled by the Soviet Union, the importance here is the technology of the Industrial Revolution because you had peaceful student protests, people like your own age, workers dissatisfied with their wages, students wanting to read more than just communist propaganda, protesting for some more liberalization, for some better conditions. And what the Hungarian government did and what the Soviet government did in Moscow was they sent in the army, they sent in the tanks, they killed people. And you see pictures on international television right, of peaceful protesters being beaten, arrested. You hear the reports that they are tortured, the ringleaders are killed. And that's not just CIA propaganda. You can see it with your own eyes. So the point is, in the 1950s, the old left realizes it needs a new strategy. Because what you either have to do at this point is say, look, we've been believing in socialism, but all of our predictions are false, and every time we try socialism, it is a disaster, and we hate the capitalists, but everything's going pretty good in the capitalist nations. We have to change our mind and say, maybe socialism is not the right thing to believe. Maybe we should become capitalists, God forbid. Right? Even if I am an atheist, communist. Right? And that's not possible, we know, for many people who are true believers in their politics. You believe your politics, you are not going to change your mind no matter what the evidence is. And if that's your psychology, you need a new strategy. And the postmodern strategy is that new strategy. And it's going to be one that says we don't need to worry about logic and evidence and data and facts and the truth about reality because philosophy is now teaching us there is no truth, there is no knowledge, there are no facts. All we have is feelings, subjectivity, passionate commitment to whatever our subjective values are. We're in a world that has divided people into warring groups. I'm in my group, you're in your group. We hate you, you hate us. All's fair in the battle. Any strategy, that's in a nutshell, the new postmodern left. Now, I want to, uh, just in a couple of minutes though, <clears throat> say I'm an enlightenment guy. And while this is a philosophical battle and a political battle, we also have lots of data on our side. The postmoderns will argue that we live in a horrible society full of exploitation. Uh oh. Excuse me one minute. Uh, there we are. That I solved the technical problem myself. Nice. So, I want to look at some data. <clears throat> this is the world. Uno ocho, uno dos. Hey. <clears throat> Little two centuries ago, the Enlightenment project of the late 1700s is now one generation old. American Revolution is over, French Revolution is over, first generation feminists arguing for equal rights, the battle against slavery is very actively engaged upon, we recognize modern chemistry, modern physics, modern biology, it's a new world but for one generation or so. This is every country in the world, big circle, big population, so there's China, uh, color-coded, that little yellow dot, does this thing work? There we are, that's the United States. And these are all European nations, Western European nations over here. Uh, Asian nations, the blue, those are African nations. Uh, and there's Canada, I'm originally from Canada, so we always have to find Canada right on the data, there we are. This is income per person. The richest countries in the world, people are earning about $2,000 per year. 
this is all adjusted for inflation and normalized. Thank you. Uh, life expectancy is on the vertical axis here, 20, 25, 30, 35. For most of human history, life expectancy was in around here. Already things are improving a little bit. But notice what, uh, just as we say, what's, what is this country? Can you guess? This is the richest country in the world. That's England, right? The home of liberal democracy, the industrial revolution, and so forth. The nation first and foremost of the Enlightenment. It's already starting to pull away. The United States, right, behind, right, but largely on the basis of Enlightenment values has been institutionalized. Uh, this is France and Germany is also here as well. So two other semi-enlightenment nations. But notice, two, oh, come on, that one, there we are. About $2,000 per person per year, life expectancy at birth, 40 years. 100 years, we're going to jump. This is 1912. Okay. So, <clears throat> England was there, now it's over here. The United States, much, much bigger. Canada, right behind, we're trying to catch up. Western European nations, big and small, all of them, by and large, enlightenment. Uh, <clears throat> Latin American nations, right down here. Different colonial history, obviously, and so forth. But some improvement. Now, 100 more years. And I'll put all three of them together. And the point is, 200 years ago, if I can do this, so this one, every country in the world is down here. Nobody is there anymore. Even the most poor, desperate nations in the world, the Bolivias of the world, the Zimbabwe's of the world, have been lifted out of horrible poverty. We go there now and we say, oh my goodness, this is so awful. And that's a measure, though, of how successful we are. I should say for Latin America, which the differences are important. This is a logarithmic scale across the bottom. So we take the United States, you know, almost $50,000 per year per person. But if we go over to here, right, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico are all in this area. That's about $14,000 a year. So the difference is three or four times, but progress overall. And the point is, socialism did not do that. Capitalism did that. Liberalism did that. Science did that. Technology did that. Tolerance of people of different races and religions when we think that is necessary, that did that. We are creating a better world and we still live in a largely enlightenment modern world. But the left does not like that, particularly the postmodern left, because it's their hated enemies the liberal capitalists who are going to get the credit for the great progress, and that is a problem. And they are very well aware in practice every time left politics and economics have been put into place, it has gone in the opposite direction. That's the strategy that we are facing now. Now, <clears throat> I want to say the progress is real, but notice that's to make claims about reality, and the postmoderns don't like that is to make a claim that there are such things as facts, that we can identify them. Right? Postmoderns don't like that. That we are making progress. Right? That's a value claim. It presupposes that there are objective standards by which we can measure decline and progress. The postmoderns don't like that. I do not want to make light of the deep philosophical issues that need to be engaged, but we do have philosophy on our side. We do have the data on our side, but we do have a very philosophical, well thought out strategy that for two generations postmoderns have been developing, that's what we are up against now. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen for that uh, magnificent lecture. Thank you very much. Just some short questions for you to answer. One or two from, from me and one or two from the public. 
Um, why immediately after the extraordinary success show by liberalism, why we lost the battle, or at least that looks like we are losing that battle. What happened, especially what happened between that, the, 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 some dates you mentioned in your book, 1785 and 1810, what happened there? Well, uh, in historical time, there was, uh, I talk about the Enlightenment, there was a reaction against the Enlightenment. Uh, one of the things, particularly in German intellectual life, now partly it's a philosophical reaction, uh, somewhat driven by you know, ethnic pride issues, that you know, the, the French are doing this and the English are doing that, and we Germans are supposed to be the best. So there's an initial tendency to reject imports, including imports of ideas from, from foreign cultures. Uh, but I think also important here is Napoleon. And if you think about the effect of Napoleon rising up taking control of France and turning it into an awesome military machine, but put yourself in the context of a German. What happens essentially is Napoleon and the French come in and they kick butt, to use colloquial. They destroy easily the Germans. And again, you have a wounded pride and you have a military occupation. But from the German intellectual perspective, a more conservative one, it was, this is what the Enlightenment means. Right? The Enlightenment means these foreign French people right, trying to conquer us and impose these foreign values on us. And we need to push back against that. Uh, and so one of the things it did do was re-energize German intellectual life in a more pro-German way. And so the Germans did get their act together significantly in the, the 1900s, but largely it was driven by a reaction. And a lot of it was that we need to react against certain kinds of foreign English values and foreign French values. So that's a very short answer, but in contemporary intellectual history, the battle between enlightenment ideas and counter enlightenment ideas, there's a lot of very good literature that one can follow up on. The second one is um, here in Argentina and also in Latin America in general, we are all familiarized with the French Revolution, but we know nothing about the Glorious Revolution. Could you tell us a little bit the difference between both? Well, yeah, I do know this, uh, my experience in Latin America, and that is a, it's a scandal, right, educationally, right, that you know a lot about the French Revolution, and you should know a lot about the French Revolution. And you know some things about the American Revolution, that also is important, but before both of them, and more importantly, paving the road was the glorious revolution in England. Now, this was uh, in 1688. The England obviously has a long history of monarchy, but parliament is in the ascendancy. Uh, there is an agricultural revolution, there's a direction in, of uh, religious toleration, the rise of uh, democratic political institutions in the English. Basically, a king comes to power, they don't want him to be the king. Parliament says to the king, go away, right? Uh, and the king does go away. And at that point, there's a major shift. And what's glorious about that, though, is you have a shift from political authoritarianism of a feudal sort to a liberal democracy right, with parliamentary procedures, religious toleration, increasing the, the vote and so forth. And it's glorious because there's no bloodshed. Right? And that's a kind of a very English way of doing things. Right? And those ideas right, crossed the Atlantic and were then implanted in the American Revolution. That one was more bloody. Uh, and of course, they did cross the English Channel to France through Voltaire and the others, and there was a French Revolution that was more bloody. So uh, I would say we can all learn from the glorious revolution uh, about how to do things. My third and last question is uh, related to the influence of Kant. In your book, you mentioned that uh, that's a turning point in history. Why? Yeah, this is one of the controversial points in my book because on some interpretations of Kant, he is a great hero of the Enlightenment. And my argument is that Kant is the first significant figure of the counter-Enlightenment, that he shares that with Rousseau. Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, more for political reasons, Kant for more philosophical reasons. And the argument, though, that I make is that Kant is putting limitations in a very deep way on the power of reason. 
And he is saying, in a philosophically fundamental way, reason cannot know reality as it really is. So there's a turn away from an objectivity, uh, reality oriented to a more subjective orientation in Kant's philosophy. Now, I don't want to overstate it because Kant was in some ways, I think legitimately, uh, 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 still a person of the 1800s, but he does on some very fundamental issues mark a turning point that the next generations of philosophers, once they figure out the implications of that revolution initiated by Kant, things become more and more skeptical until by the time we get to the 20th century, philosophy is in a very skeptical place. Una pregunta del público. Vamos a agarrar, sorry chicos, pero tenemos una agenda bien cargada. Tomamos al de, puede ser en español o en inglés, como quieras, te traducen de un lugar a otro. Parado, porfa. Momentito. Sorry. Hola. I wanted to ask you about the importance of self-defense in a liberal society. Nowadays we realize that there is a need for order and hence security and that implicates a need for taxes that is troublesome for some liberal people because we don't want to take without people being willing but we understand the need for that order. But we know there is a limit. If you have too much taxes and too much police, you have essentially a police state where there is no individual freedom, and that's very troublesome for us. So I think a very big complement to the security a police force can provide is being aware that no one is going to care more for your own life than yourself. So the self-defense is a big issue. And like you said, Western society has kind of push away from that mentality of as long as you don't harm anyone, you can have guns, you can defend yourself, as long as you keep in mind that you should not harm anyone else and try to only use them in the good of society. Okay, that's a good and rich question. Uh, yes, we do need security, we do need order, uh, but primarily we need to be secure in our freedoms and the order that emerges, a lot of that has to be done in a genuinely liberal society through cultural institutions and not political institutions. Because the idea of a liberal society is that we're going to be free to govern our religious lives, our scientific lives, our economic lives, our family lives, all of our lives according to our, our own lights without the government telling us what to do. Uh, and using, using its, its forceful threats against us. So that though means that we need to figure out ourselves socially how to evolve and create institutions so that we can trust each other and that we know that when we shake hands or sign a contract that we can trust each other and so forth. So a lot of the cultural work to create the order that is going to enable us to trust each other and, and, and work hard and so forth, that we are going to do it ourselves. Now, at the same time, I do think there is a very legitimate role for uh, government and uh, institutions of coercion uh, as an extension of our self-defense, right, the way that you put it there. Uh, one of the things that we know is that human beings can be very hot-headed, we, we can be biased, and even well-meaning people, when we have disagreements about important things, won't be able to resolve those disputes. So we do need an impartial final authority that we can take our disputes to so that we're going to resolve them peacefully, as opposed to having some sort of, well, we'll take it to the streets, and that's always going to be very, very destructive. But at the same time, we are delegating very awesome power to the government. Right? The, the, the amount of power that the police have, that the military have, is an awesome power, and that power needs to be checked. And one way right, to have that checked is by having citizens who are willing to be assertive not only against people who are going to threaten them in the immediate time, robbers, muggers, assaulters, and so forth, but against their own government because all of history shows governments, when they get power, they start to abuse that power, and that needs to be checked. Now, there can be, of course, checks and balances within political systems, but the most important check is a vigilant citizenry that is keeping an eye on the government, not letting it get away with various things, and uh, in the most serious cases, yes, the, the citizens will rise up uh, violently and institute a political revolution when the government gets too bad. Se señores, 
Eh, Hicks tiene agenda completa hasta el 2020, es un privilegio haberlo tenido aquí, lo despedimos con un fuerte aplauso.